welcome again to, to SIRGI. Let me introduce uh, the, the panelists today. Uh, at, the, at the far end, we have uh, Sabine Pfeiffer, who started her career as a toolmaker and is now a professor of technology, work and society at the University Erlangen Nuremberg. And so her research is very closely related to the topic of the panel, which, as you know, is about e-mobility automation and uh, labor markets and education. Uh, Manfred Wolf uh, in, in the middle is the Work uh, Council's uh, chairperson uh, of the Volkswagen plant at Emden. Uh, you may know that the Emden plant will relocate uh, the Passat production to the Klaseni plant over here, and, uh, and the idea is to produce electric cars in, in this uh, North German uh, uh, Volkswagen plant. And uh, Manfred Wolf is the council's member responsible for qualification and vocational training at uh, Volkswagen Emden. So uh, obviously some of the questions at the panel will be about retraining um, uh, towards automation and, and, and e-mobility. And uh, we have uh, uh, Jan Schweiner, second from the left, uh, professor of economics at Columbia University and the founding father of, of CERGI. And, so, and finally, we have, and last but not least, we have Jan Klasla from the Ministry of Trade and Industry of the Czech Republic, who is one of the co-authors of the national AI strategy of the Czech Republic, which was recently uh, um, written and approved <laughs> um, uh, here. So some of the questions on an AI um, you know, should, should get a very qualified uh, answer from, from the panel. Uh, so th there was a day-long workshop. Um, where so we and starting with Jan's keynote lecture, uh, and so you know that there is more and more evidence on the issues of the panel uh, produced by in academia as well as in applied research, but that we also don't have enough evidence to so many of these questions will have to be open ended. Um, one of the papers which was to be presented by Florian Lammer of IABE. Um, argued that there is evidence for workers in companies that introduce automation, robots, uh, and, and AI not being threatened by this new digital and automation technology because they do get retrained and retooled uh, for the future, but that it's the workers in companies that invest in traditional technologies who end up uh, losing their jobs or suffering in terms of wages. Um, because of, of this new wave of uh, the fourth wave of industrialization, if you will. So, um, th and there was obviously more evidence on these issues. So, with, uh, with that background, uh, let me um, open with questions that relate to immobility and automation processes, and uh, perhaps uh, start with uh, Professor Pfeiffer and, and Mr. Wolf uh, with questions on how. Does e-mobility and uh, automation uh, affect the German and Czech labor markets by extension, and especially how does it affect education and vocational systems, and what is the role of public policy in this transformation of education? Um, I, one last thing to set it up. At CERGI, we had um, uh, a presentation a couple months back by um, uh, World Bank uh, representatives Harry Petrinos, and also discussion about a recent analysis by PricewaterhouseCoopers, which which tried to uh, identify occupations that are at high risk of uh, well replacement by robots, right? High risk of automation. So the Czech Republic was obviously very high on this uh, ranking because we have a high share of these types of uh, routine mechanical uh, manufacturing based occupations. So maybe the question for Professor Pfeiffer is whether you believe that those rankings are meaningful and that indeed Germany and the Czech Republic is at high risk of losing jobs in those occupations. Any comments? Yes, thank you for this question, which is I think sometimes uh, I get tired about this kind of question, not because of you are asking for it, but um, because we have a study over study about the question uh, what kind of jobs will go away. Um, and the problem with all of, almost all of those studies is that they assume that all kind of work that is near at machines has to be routinized work. 
and then they put it in the with the, put the label routinized on it and they say okay how many people do we have and if it's already routinized of course we can easily easier substitute it by any kind of technology which in the core argument is true of course if you want to um, substitute human work by any kind of technology first you have to standardize it but the assumption that that um, for example people with a vocational training on a shop floor um, like a production line at Volkswagen is just routinized work it's just not true um, what I do in my study is really going at the workplace, talking to people, really try to understand, really grasp what they are really doing. And if you look, for example, um, on people who are um, responsible for eight of the old kind of robots, big ones, um, what they are doing eight, eight hours a day is stepping inside the process all the time to keep it going 20 to 30 time a day uh, with something that nobody sees because because they are doing it the process is running smoothly if they would stop doing this kind of work um, then you would see what they are doing um, the, I think the real problem is that we have um, such a such a um, and in academia, we have those people who are working with quantified data uh, on the labor market level, and we have other researchers uh, where I am working most of the time who do qualitative case studies at the workplace. And we are talking not to each other most of the time. Um, and that's a real problem because if we want to really understand what's going on on the shop level, for example, um, uh, with the new uh, um, possibilities of automation, we really have to go down to the shop floor and really understand what are the possibilities we have there on the technological side and how they are applied at the company and why are they applied like they are applied. Because in the, with all the new technologies, what's really new, uh, I would say, is that there, that's not a determination how you use, for example, wearables or AI. Um, it's a decision if you if you design the workplace broad um, from the tasks that are required there, or if we do it other ways. Um, so you have to understand why is a company going this way or that way? Is, are there technical um, hurdles? Are there um, does it have to do with industrial relations or what, whatever? Um, and then if you really understand that, you can maybe try to make a prognosis on the quantitative level. But what we at the moment have all those rankings and all those um, studies, um, they always assume that shop floor work is routinized and they always assume that any kind of work that is somehow doing anything with media is creative and both as assumptions are assumptions they, and we have so much qualitative studies um, that prove otherwise but we don't combine those um, different methodological views and I think we ha really have to start that if you want to, to, to understand and really help for example politicians or um, job council um, representatives um, from an academic point, um, just looking into the glass bowl <laughs> um, wouldn't help. Okay. Well, thank you. Any, any reaction from other panelists on how to reconcile the quantitative analyses across labor markets that suggest that automation or robots may kill jobs with the qualitative studies that show that within companies, automation does not go hand in hand with job destruction? Just point out that I, I agree that very often, or, or there are cases where automation does not lead to decline in labor use where it is expected to result in that. There is a good case of uh, banks, for instance, where there are case studies where introducing ATM machines was widely expected to reduce the number of bank tellers, right? Because essentially you don't need it. Turns out that in many of these cases, um, 
Uh, the tellers were actually used for other things, so they were reused, uh, essentially client-based services uh, expanded dramatically, and so this labor was not laid off, was not reduced, but was in fact increased. However, I'm wondering in this case, as I understand it, and I'm not an expert on e-cars, electric cars, but electric vehicles, but my sense is that much less labor is needed to produce these cars since they don't have uh, engines and things uh, as usual. So can there actually be an increase in employment? What would be produced? So like in the case of ATMs, I'm saying the result was that it was needed, to, people were needed to increase client services, cross-selling of various products, and so on and so forth. What would these workers be used in these plants when they don't produce engines, etc.? Is there, is there expectation, Mr. Wolf, that there will be fewer workers needed to produce a car with an electric engine? Ja, also es gibt natürlich Studien und auch die Studien. Also es gibt gerade von meiner Gewerkschaft ähm, eine große Studie, die in Deutschland durchgeführt worden ist. Was bedeutet denn die Elektromobilität mit ähm, dem Wegfall von Arbeitsplätzen? Und ähm, die geht von verschiedenen Parametern aus, ähm, aber in Deutschland kursiert dann äh, die hauptsächliche Meinung, dass dort 30 Prozent der Arbeitsplätze dann wegfallen. Ähm, ich persönlich halte das für sehr hoch gegriffen, weil das aus meiner Sicht in einer Automobilfabrik, wie sie in Emden stattfindet, ähm, so nicht eintreffen wird, meine Meinung. Weil es wird nach wie vor bei einem Elektroauto, ähm, es werden Karosserieteile zusammengeschweißt werden müssen, es wird eine Lackiererei geben und es wird ganz viel innerhalb des Autos in den Montagen in ein Elektroauto eingebaut werden müssen und das auch von manuellen, also von Menschen, die das tun. Und ähm, unstrittig ist, dass bei der Herstellung eines Motors, eines Verbrenners natürlich viel mehr Handgriffe nötig sind als dann bei einem Elektromotor. Das heißt, bei einem Elektroantrieb brauche ich nur noch 200 Teile, die zusammengefertigt werden. Bei einem Verbrennungsmotor sind es 1400 Teile. Dafür muss ich dann nicht schlau sein, um zu sagen, dafür brauche ich weniger Hände. Das ist ganz klar. Aber an sich, in der gesamten Wertschöpfung des Autos, fallen nicht 30 Prozent der Arbeitsplätze weg. Meiner Meinung nach in einer Fabrik, wie sie in Emden dann da ist. Also hat für mich die Elektromobilität erstmal direkt nichts mit einem dramatischen ähm, Abbau von Arbeitsplätzen zu tun. Sondern es gibt dann natürlich Bereiche drumherum wie zum Beispiel in einem Büro, was gerade schon besprochen worden ist, wo ich natürlich immer einhergehende gleiche Tätigkeiten habe, die dann irgendwann durch Robotics oder wie auch immer durch Systeme ersetzt werden können. Aber direkt, äh, um ein Auto zu bauen, fallen nicht diese Art in der Höhe von Arbeitsplätzen weg. Das, was dann abhängig davon in einer anderen Diskussion stattfindet, ist, wenn ich nach neuesten Erkenntnissen jetzt ein neues Auto baue, das heißt, ich baue eine neue Halle, ich baue die neuesten Strukturen innerhalb einer Fabrik auf, dann ist klar, dass ich die neuesten Erkenntnisse der Produktion dort einkehren lasse und das verbindet dann die Automatisierung mit einem Arbeitsplatzabbau, weil ich habe einfach neue, neue Wege, neue Techniken, die ich einsetzen kann. Und das ist für mich durch die Automatisierung ein Wegfall von Arbeitsplätzen hat aber für mich direkt nichts mit der Elektromobilität zu tun, sondern einfach mit der zukünftig ausgerichteten ähm, Produktivität, die einfach jeder Automobilhersteller in neu gebauten Hallen dann einfach vor sich hat und dann auch umsetzen wird. Okay, Uh, I would like to just add that there is a special study focused on Czech labor market prepared uh, by the Technological Center, commissioned by the Office of the Gover Government. And uh, it is focused uh, not just on the Czech market, but also the authors, well, um, they focus on the skills, not uh, just on the jobs. So, uh, so the outcome is uh, um, a quite comprehensive economic model focused on Uh, the skills that will be probably automated. It is based on the original um, Osborne and Frey model, and uh, the authors used uh, also McKenzie uh, and uh, 
uh, Deloitte, uh, Deloitte work and uh, we know or at least we expect that uh, the, well, of course, the, the routine jobs are endangered, but also uh, the, let's say, medium income jobs are in uh, probable danger uh, by auto automation. Uh, this study was one of uh, the, let's say, baselines for the national AI strategy. So uh, there is this, there, there is this job that has been done, and. Uh, Actually, you can find it easily on the website of uh, the Office of the Government, and there is also uh, the English uh, summary so, uh, with the model. So uh, please, uh, if you can look at it, I think it's a quite, quite a good job. But uh, of course, it's not the Oracle. So, if, if, if I may try to summarize, if, so, so there is evidence on the effect of actual automation, actual you know, introduction of robots on total employment across labor markets that suggests uh, significant job losses. And then there are studies that argue that in companies that do introduce um, automated production or ro robotic production, machine operators, which are usually the highest ranked uh, occupation at the highest risk of, of automation, actually don't go away. Machine operators become more sophisticated and are really involved in the, in, in the continuous production. But that, those two types of evidence are perhaps consistent with each other or can be reconciled. If we, um, again, recall the, the study by uh, Dr. Lemmer from IAB, which argues that in companies that invest into automation, jobs are kept or may even grow, but in companies that invest in traditional technology, jobs are lost because the companies that do automate become more productive and, and compete, outcompete the traditional companies out of the market. So perhaps both types of evidence can, can be rec reconciled. Now, with, with, we already started talking about e-mobility, so perhaps this is the right time to ask a battery of questions on how does the move towards e-mobility and automation affect uh, vocational systems, education systems, what is the role of public policy, and which occupations do you think will be, or which types of skills will be needed in Emden, for example, as you make the transition into new type of production, new production lines, and whether it's going to be the, the firms, the workers, or the state that will pay for the retraining. So again, questions on both public policy and education and the actual transformation, perhaps again starting with Professor Pfeiffer. I could say something about how the German vocational system is already um, reacting to um, 4.0, Industry 4.0, all, all the new um, uh, possibilities of automation. Um, this autumn, 28 new or newly reformed vocations went on the market. <laughs> um, so the I would say the as in Germany, it's a really uh, vital institutional system, the whole vocational system, where you have on one hand a, um, a scientific institution, the BIP, with doing research, what is needed, um, where you have um, both sides of industrial relations sitting on, on the board and really deciding what what kind of qualifications, what kind of skills should be put on the broader <laughs> perspective and what not. So you have a quite good um, perspective from different sides who decide what is needed and w are we too early with some kind of things or are we now really at the moment where we have to put it on the broader level? Um, I think that's a that's a really good institution, and it's not a it's it's not a um, or it's no coincidence that, um, for example, China is trying to to bring a vocational system into life. Um, the U.S. is talking for some years now that they have a. Um, uh, engineering talent, uh, manufacturing talent gap, which needs qualified people right under the engineering level. Um, and the problem always is that what they lack is uh, the institutional system. It's, uh, you need uh, both three sides. You need a uh, 
kind of uh, industrial relations that um, despite all um, conflicts are able to sit on the table on talking about qualification um, which we have in Germany and I, I would say um, the, the vocational system is reacting in a, in a quite uh, good pace but it's not overreacting and this is also um, important so that you don't put things into the vocational training the companies are not at the moment able to really deliver and the schools also um, and maybe are not just needed on some small spots um, you have to get it a good balance when, when are really new things getting in the vocational system and what kind of qualifications or aspects should be put out um, and I think it's, 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 it's quite good in reacting and sometimes it was too early, for example, the vocation of production technologist, which came in 2009, which is a, a vocation, I would say, is something like the perfect worker for Industry 4.0 and it was just too early. Most people didn't understand it, most companies said, I don't need that, what is that? So it was just too early. <laughs> so also this happens. But I think it's a good system. Um, like all systems, you have uh, there are ideas to reform it, but um, it's reacting in a pretty good way, I would say. Praxis heraus würde ich sagen, dass es jetzt verfrüht ist, über neue Berufe zu sprechen, die wir schon ab übermorgen haben. Weil wir fangen jetzt erst an, Elektroautos zu bauen und es wird Übergänge geben. Es wird Übergänge geben müssen, weil die Berufe, die wir jetzt haben, sind die Basis von dem, wie über Jahrzehnte Autos gebaut worden sind. Und es wird jetzt bei Elektroautos zusätzliche Qualifikationen geben müssen, die in die jetzt vorhandenen Berufe meiner Meinung nach einhergehen. Um dann in ein paar Jahren dann zu sagen, jetzt haben wir einen neuen Beruf kreiert, der mit so viel Zusatzqualifikationen überfrachtet ist und wir werden uns dann anschauen, was brauchen wir nicht mehr vermitteln. Und in Deutschland durch das duale Ausbildungssystem, glaube ich, ist die Verzahnung zwischen Berufsschule, also dem theoretischen und der praktischen Ausbildung sehr gut aufgestellt, um das dann meistern zu können. Dass man sich wirklich immer von Jahr zu Jahr angucken muss, wie verändert sich die Anforderung äh, an, an den Beruf. Und ähm, am Anfang werden wir, wie gesagt, über Zusatzqualifikationen die Berufe aufpimpen, um dann zu sagen, wir können jetzt Inhalte weglassen, um dann neue Berufe zu kreieren. Das Gleiche ist ja vor Jahren schon passiert mit dem Kfz-Mechatroniker. Früher ein klarer Mechaniker im Kfz-Bereich. Dann ist die Elektrik dazu gekommen für den Motorraum. In Zukunft werden wir diesen Beruf, um ein klassisches Beispiel zu nennen, sicherlich chemische Grundlagen vermitteln müssen, weil die Batterietechnik dazu gehört. Und dieses wird dann so einhergehen, dass der irgendwann vielleicht nur anders genannt wird. Aber die Inhalte werden sich so aufmischen, dass wir klassische Dinge, die wir in den letzten Jahr, Jahren gebraucht haben, nicht mehr brauchen. Und dann werden wir irgendwann feststellen, das ist ein neuer Beruf. Die IT wird mit Sicherheit auch einhergehen müssen, weil das werden wir brauchen, um ähm, das Auto komplett als fahrendes Tablet irgendwann bedienen zu können. Weil so wird in Zukunft ein Elektroauto ausgestattet sein. Das heißt, die Software wird einen immensen Anteil an einem Pkw ähm, beanspruchen in, in den nächsten Jahren. Und das wird auf die Beruflichkeit auch Auswirkungen haben. Aber nichtsdestotrotz brauchen wir, um die ganzen Maschinen bedienen zu können, Weiterhin Mechaniker, wir brauchen Werkzeugmacher, um Werkzeuge herzustellen, dass die Autos auch gepresst werden können. Also wir werden mit Sicherheit nicht eine komplette Revolution der gesamten Berufsausbildung erleben, sondern wir werden schleichend einige Berufe verlieren und andere werden durch andere Qualifikationen aufgefüllt werden. Davon bin ich überzeugt und das wird in den nächsten Jahren schleichend passieren. Um, we all probably agree that uh, education is the answer on many questions, um, let's say in the area of future work, but unfortunately not on all of them. Uh, disruption from its very nature is quite unexpected 
uh, disruptive and uh, we need to be prepared uh, also in, uh, let's say, uh, other areas of public policy like uh, the public support uh, social system and support for the companies, especially the SMEs. Uh, therefore, the, our national strategy, AI strategy, follows the so-called coordinated plan of the EU, of the European Commission, sorry. And uh, we uh, focus on establishing a system uh, that will be prepared on uh, both, uh, let's say, uh, upcoming trends and changes that we can presume, uh, and also on, uh, let's say, disruptive changes. So we are working closely with uh, the Confederation of Industry and Trade, uh, NGOs, as well as other social partners like trade unions. And, uh, well, the goal is to uh, be prepared for uh, anything that can happen. The real answer is that we don't know. Uh, as you said, we don't have a crystal ball, and uh, we need to. And the public policy needs to be prepared for uh, all this, all these possibilities. We are talking about uh, uh, reskilling and upskilling uh, in cases of any, uh, let's say, huge disruption that can that can come. We we don't know. That's uh, that's about the. And well, the disruptive forces can be quite uh, quite fast, and we are uh, heavily dependent on, let's say, one part of the of the industry. So the Czech Republic needs to be prepared, and that's the aim of the chapters, especially chapters four and five of the national strategy. So let me maybe I'm sorry react to that. So I also happen to be a member of the R and D and I Council of the Czech Republic which has recently approved the new national innovation strategy. But the innovation strategy does not have a pillar that would focus on the impact of innovation automation AI on the labor market. Right? There is not sufficiently developed strategy for that. Uh, however, let me, before we get into that, because I think that's a separate important topic on public policy, uh, let me try to uh, highlight the, the contrast that we've heard here. So Germany, has a very well developed system of, of well tripartite or you know, employers and uh, uh, you know worker representatives uh, and the uh, vocational system working together and uh, as far as I can understand I mean there, it's partly too early to specify the new types of occupations but this work is ongoing there's an effort to try to identify these occupations and introduce them in contrast the Czech Republic is a country which traditionally complains about its vocational system being divorced from the production part of the economy, from companies, not having good linkages between the needs of, of or between the forward-looking needs of employers. Now, we do have employers who complain that they don't have, you know, workers trained for what they're doing now, but uh, perhaps there is less effort in terms of trying to identify future needs. So. The traditional advice, again going back to the presentation by Harry Petronas from the World Bank, the traditional advice you would get from an economist is, well, uh, education is a great investment. It's hard to identify which types of skills will be needed. Therefore, as a you know, general policy, the country should focus on providing good general skills, focus on increasing cognitive abilities. Now, that's hard. We don't really know how to do it. There's not a lot of good evidence on how to increase cognitive skills. So focus on the basics, qualities of, of teachers, and not don't worry so much about trying to identify the exact skill which is going to be needed 10 years from now because it's very difficult. So I'm just trying to contrast whether every country is able to do what I hear you in Germany doing, which is using the close linkages between vocational education, employers, and workers in trying to identify the specific skills. Perhaps com countries that don't have such good relationships should not try to do that and just focus on general education. Any reaction on that would be great. And also, specifically in, in Volkswagen, and I know we need to get back to the AI policy, there's plenty of time, uh, who, who will actually retrain the workers who are already at the plant? Is it going to be Volkswagen? Is, it, is there going to be help from, from the government? Trying to stimulate some also, es wird so sein, 
dass die Qualifizierung für die breite Masse der Menschen, die die Autos zusammenbauen, das wird Volkswagen in Qualifikationen äh, selber organisieren können. Es wird aber Zeiten geben, so wie jetzt in Zwickau, das ist ja das erste Werk, was vollständig auf die Elektromobilität setzt und jetzt ja am Ende des Jahres das erste elektronische Auto bauen wird, ist es so, dass natürlich dort schon klar war, dass bei einem Abriss einer ganzen Linie Zeiten sind, das heißt, die Kolleginnen und Kollegen sind über mehrere Wochen nicht beschäftigt. Dieses kann ein Unternehmen nicht alleine schultern. Und dafür gibt es Gespräche in der Politik in Deutschland, wo es dann dazu übergeht, dass wir schon über ein Kurzarbeitergeld, über ein Transformationskurzarbeitergeld nachdenken müssen, weil das ist die Forderung an die Politik, darauf zu reagieren, wenn ein Unternehmen, was jahrzehntelang Verbrennermotoren, geba äh, Verbrennerautos gebaut hat, dann irgendwann in die Elektromobilität einsteigt, einsteigen muss, dass dieses nicht alleine von dem Unternehmen zu schultern ist. Da braucht es dann regulatorische Dinge aus der Pol Politik. Allerdings die Qualifikation, die innerhalb des Werkes oder eines Werkes oder eines Unternehmens stattfinden kann, das wird mit der Berufsausbildung, das wird mit der Akademie bei uns im Emder Werk auch so stattfinden, dass es Qualifikationen da innerhalb des Werkes gibt und da setzt Volkswagen dann auch neue Maßstäbe, indem es uns jetzt auch wieder gelungen ist, mehrere Millionen Jahr für Jahr neu in die Budgets reinzuschreiben, die dafür notwendig sind, um das zu machen. Und das ist da auch gelungen. Allerdings geht es da nicht ganz ohne Politik. Das ist auch klar. That's a really interesting question about how specific or how broad, how general should qualifications, should skills be. Um, on one hand, I would say, yes, that's true. We, we don't really, nobody of us really knows how the future really will look like. So nobody can really say, put this kind of qualification now into any kind of education system because we will need it in 15 years. Um, that said, I would on the other hand say our vocational system is a broad qualification, provides a broad qualification. It's Normally it's a three-year um, training um, where, where you get for a specific It's not so specific. For example, if you look at a vocational training of a mechatronic, um, those young people get in three years a really broad um, introduction, practical and theoretical, on a, on a variety of different production technologies. Um, and with this fundamental um, provision that they, they are easily in the in the position um, that we see in if they go are in in, in their jobs for years or decades um, even without AI and even without electromobility we have a we had a lot of change on the production floor in the years before nobody was interested in that <laughs> nobody in politics was talking about that but if you look in in, in production uh, companies There was a lot of change all the decades before too, and people um, um, are able to doing it. And what we often forget about is that change is not just coming on top on the on the production floor. It has to be made. The change, it, especially if you have an old production line and new technologies come into this old line. People have to combine it. People have to make it really happen in a robust, in an effective way. This is work too, and this is done by the people on the shop floor. Um, so I think um, vocational training is is the best combination, maybe, for um, providing a broad basis, um, but putting new specific things into this broad thing if, if it's needed. But not with a, with a perspective on what will we need in 15 years, but what are we seeing is happening in industry and we have put it smoothly into the system. And I think that's a good combination. Maybe not perfect, but the best I think we have at the moment. No, I think what, what has been said uh, makes a lot of sense. I think what makes it difficult is that the change is very rapid and potentially you know, very disruptive. So I think having the 
close interaction of the uh, partners in industrial relations certainly makes sense because having both the management technicians and the workers uh, share information and try to adjust makes a lot of sense. Uh, in the United States, for instance, it's not so much. So uh, in that sense, the German system is better. Um, on the other hand, I think what there is, and we talked about it a little bit in the morning, there is also an attempt to kind of plan, to do manpower planning, where there is uh, forecasting as to you know, what will be needed uh, several years down the line. And that's usually done in a very quantitative type way, uh, where you sort of say, we'll need this many engineers of this type, this many technicians of this type, and so on. There one can go very wrong, but it is apparently used quite a lot. I was at an interesting talk at the Boston Consulting Group uh, the other day where Reiner Strack, who is the chief uh, worldwide officer helping companies precisely with this kind of thing, was showing a huge matrix of how they figure out how each company will need how many people in, in what. And it struck me that uh, it really is very uh, quantitative in the sense that it doesn't take into account prices, you know, wages, how they will evolve, and so on and so forth. And obviously, labor markets have flexibility in terms of adjusting on that margin as well, which is not being taken into account. And especially in periods when uh, there are dramatic changes, unexpected ones, uh, one can be quite wrong in training too many people or too few people in certain directions that a model like that will produce. So I think that uh, uh, there will be painful adjustments in the sense that things will not be forecast correctly, either by not training enough or training too much in certain directions. And um, yeah, in that sense, the US approach, which has many shortcomings, but as Stepan mentioned, is uh, more geared towards general education, trying to keep people versatile and able to adjust, uh, you know, maybe may have an advantage, we'll see. I just wanted to react to what you said. Uh, actually, I didn't want to make uh, things complicated. However, uh, the so-called innovation strategy is the umbrella framework uh, for the Czech state and Czech economy. And I wouldn't expect to have, you know, speci like a specific uh, proposals uh, to be there like uh, in, in the area of education. Uh, those are in other binding government documents. Uh, for instance, uh, we can say that the AI strategy is one, one of the first uh, first um, verticals. Um, and of course, I know and we all know that we are pretty good in drafting strategies in Czech Republic. But I can assure you that uh, this time, uh, at least, there is a lot of effort to uh, to make it happen. For instance, you mentioned Harry Patinas, and uh, thanks to Tege, uh, there was the roundtable with, with Mr. Patinas, and one of the guests is currently the new head of uh, Section of the Ministry of Education, that is responsible for the uh, let's say um, a reform of our educational system. So I believe that even even you helped uh, the state to to change it a little bit, and I believe it will not stay just on on, on paper. Well, thank you. Before we before we make more of a transition into the AI group of issues, uh, let me and conclude the automotive part of of the panel with uh, w with a more speculative question. So, what do you see? Are the risks that the European automotive sector will be left behind, that we will not... So Volkswagen is obviously more aggressive in the transition into e-mobility than maybe other European car makers, but how do you, how do you see you know, this industry, which obviously is very important for the Czech Republic, I guess everybody knows that Slovakia and the Czech Republic have the highest production of cars per capita, right? Uh, um, so what, what do you see the risks of, of um, European automotive uh, sector being left behind? Nein, das glaube ich nicht. Ähm, wenn, wir, wenn wir denn in der Lage sind zu erkennen, welche Chancen das denn auch bietet und wir müssen Entscheidungen relativ schnell treffen und das äh, in einer europäischen Gemeinschaft, wie wir uns sie denn alle wünschen, weil die Chinesen schlafen nicht auf den Bäumen und was sonst auch noch in den anderen äh, Kontinenten passiert, ähm, braut sich ja zusammen und äh, gerade in Deutschland durch die Schlüsselindustrie, äh, die wir ja durch die Automobilindustrie haben, ähm, haben wir einen Fund und jahrzehntelange Erfahrung und ähm, 
dieses zu bündeln, das ist unheimlich wichtig. Und Tschechien wird ähm, durch Volkswagen, durch Skoda, was dort passiert, natürlich auch einen Riesenanteil daran haben, ähm, was Volkswagen denn denkt und wie sie es denken. Und deswegen ist es unvermeidbar für mich, nicht nur über die Sch äh, Risiken zu reden, sondern auch über die Chancen. Und da muss ich eindeutig sagen, dass wir auf 40 Prozent der Wertschöpfung an einem Elektromobil nicht verzichten sollten. Und das ist die Zellfertigung. Und in der Zellfertigung, wenn die denn dann auch europäisch gedacht und dann auch abgebildet wird, dann ist es so, dass wir dort Arbeitsplätze schaffen oder zumindest auffangen, die dann vermeintlich durch die andere ähm, Arbeit dann im Halt wegfallen kann. Und dort ist es jetzt so, dass Volkswagen sich ja vor zwei Wochen entschieden hat, in die europäische Zellfertigung einzusteigen. Und zwar wird in Salzgitter eine Zellfertigung aufgebaut werden. Und wenn Volkswagen in den nächsten Jahren 10 Millionen, also in den nächsten zwölf Jahren 10 Millionen Fahrzeuge verkaufen will, und da gehört natürlich auch Skoda dazu, dann ist es nur logisch, für die neuen Autos Zellen herzustellen, die in Europa hergestellt werden. Also wir brauchen mehrere Zellfabriken. Und Zellfabriken bedeuten Arbeit. Und Zellfabriken müssen dort stehen, wo die Autos zusammengebaut werden. Also ist es für mich auch strategisch nur sinnvoll, wenn die Automobilhersteller Zellfabriken in Europa bauen und somit Arbeitsplätze schaffen und sich nicht abhängig machen von den Asiaten, die uns dann irgendwann ähm, abhängig machen von dem, was sie uns dann irgendwann mal schicken. Da müssen wir europäisch zusammenhalten und das ist erkannt worden. Und da ist es dann wichtig, dass die europäische Gemeinschaft auch zusammensteht, um Rahmenbedingungen so günstig zu gestalten, dass in den einzelnen Ländern diese Zellfabriken entstehen können. Und das bedingt dann zusätzliche Arbeitsplätze und deswegen glaube ich, dass es auch ganz viele Chancen gibt. Und wenn das die Automobilindustrie verstanden hat, und die Politik dann auch so weit treibt, diese Rahmenbedingungen zu schaffen, dann funktioniert das in Europa. Und dann bin ich nicht bange, dass wir mit unseren Automobilherstellern, die wir so haben, und nicht nur Volkswagen, sondern auch Mercedes oder Daimler und natürlich Skoda, die zu Volkswagen gehören, dann werden wir riesengroße Chancen haben. Aber dann müssen wir die Weichen rechtzeitig stellen und das dann auch ganz schnell und nicht über Jahre debattieren. something um, politics are talking about electromobility at least in germany i don't know how it is here but in germany for years now and they spend a lot of money into the topic but this money didn't went into infrastructure and infrastructure is key um, things like smart grid and all those things um, it's not only where you get the power for your car it's also ideas like smart grid and things like that. And as politics is just talking about it, doing some platform things, it's all nice, but um, we really um, are lacking uh, infrastructure. And if we don't go into that area, and I think we should do it Europe-wide, and, and we have to um, initiate infrastructure building also in the markets we want to put our cars. <laughs> if we are not succeeding on that side and everybody knows that I mean the, we have all those studies that we see all those small small amount of countries who are getting into electromobility did start with the infrastructure like Norway or California um, and this is really more than five after 12 like you would say in German um, we have really go into that without infrastructure, e-mobility wouldn't go. And that would be really a pity because I think the um, European um, automotive sector have, has the power to go this way. I, I'm really confident um, that they will do it, but without infrastructure, all those cars will go nowhere. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, you are at, at, at an economics institute, so I guess most economists as well as most European countries would like Germany to run deficits to invest in infrastructure. <laughs> Please do that if you can, um, uh, <laughs> instead of austerity. Um, um, that was not so helpful. Um, so um, let, let me try to maybe you know, comment or bridge into AI. Question. You know, quick, quick question. Yeah. I, you know, I'm just wondering um, with the technology here in terms of battery production. So, so the assumption here is that Europe 
you know, Germany, let's say, but Europe generally, can catch up and become a leader in this. And I'm wondering, is that feasible? And if uh, it needs government assistance, uh, how will that square with the um, EU competition policy, you know, in terms of subsidies and so on? Uh, will that be, you know, easily done? And, uh, and will <clears throat> Europe really catch up here? Uh, because we see how difficult it is for Europe to catch up in the digital technology arena where the top 10, 20 firms are not European. They're essentially American, Chinese, you know, a little bit of uh, Japan, Korea. So why will this be different? Why will Europe succeed in this? Just, just a short remark. Uh, well, you ask about the best scenario. Um, I was in Detroit last year and uh, they told us the story of a state with 10 million people uh, heavily dependent on automotive and uh, used to have uh, well uh, early low unemployment. It was in 2007. 2010 they had 30% uh, of unemployment. So that's gonna happen in Czech Republic when the Europe and the European automotive, uh, uh, let's say, stay or uh, being left behind, uh, that's the best scenario. Uh, so we can look to, to countries or to states like Michigan. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, or hopefully, no financial crisis is, other financial crisis is coming, but uh, we talk to guys from uh, GM or Ford, they are very afraid of uh, companies like Google or Apple. So, uh, well, as I said before, we don't know. Uh, the deception may come. And the only, uh, the only, uh, let's say, advice we got from from uh, them was uh, just uh, differentiate, just uh, you know, uh, the current uh, important uh, industries from the new bets. So basically, diversify uh, your economy. Uh, don't be so so heavily dependent. Uh, however important it is. But uh, we have to focus on uh, new technologies, on, on uh, as Professor Schreiner said, on building uh, new European, new European uh, stars. Because uh, if something happens, some kind of big disruption, uh, it will be like in Michigan, and it was not really a nice story to hear. And I would, I would, I want to to live in that in I don't know, 10, 15 years. Perhaps this is the ideal segue to start talking more about AI. So while e-mobility and automation is happening now, AI is the next thing that's probably going to hit us, right? So one, the idea is that you're now replacing more, uh, you know, more occupa high occupations with higher level of skills, the way it's defined today. We shouldn't train any more radiologists because the machine can diagnose uh, pro health problems better from from an x-ray than, than a trained doctor can. So uh, again, the same types of questions. What is the role of the education system? And what are what is the role of the government in terms of AI strategies? How do you see this playing out both in Germany, Czech Republic, and Europe more broadly? I guess that's well, uh, talking about uh, AI policy, um, well, we need to we need to see the or uh, at least at least try to address challenges on three different levels. On the global one, we are talking about the competitiveness of the whole Europe and uh, the so-called battle for talent. There are really excellent um, developers and and scientists in the in the field of AI. Uh, on the let's say regional level, we are talking about our economy. As I just mentioned, uh, we are talking about. Uh, our productivity, the wages and, and uh, jobs. Uh, on the national level, we are talking uh, about the digital transformation of companies and the economy. Uh, as, as a good policymaker, we need to address all of them. On the global one, Czech government committed to uh, support the best, uh, the best scientists to build uh, so-called centers of uh, center of excellence in AI. Uh, the so-called testing facilities and other AI centers, not for instance, for, uh, AI for manufacturing. Uh, you probably heard about the great recap grant we, we got um, that's focused more on the manufacturing. So uh, this should help and this should be, this should be like a world-class center uh, 
uh, attracting talents from all over the world. Uh, Prague shall become one of the AI super hubs. Uh, it's not just about money. Uh, there are special visa programs. There are programs to attract people, to attract them with families. So we are one of the most safe cities in, in the world. So um, this is the first one. The and, and of course, our aim is to help the whole Europe to catch up, at least try to catch up uh, with China and with, uh, with uh, US in our way of developing, in a European way of development of AI, we call it, or European Commission call it, um, they, call it they call it like uh, trustworthy AI, so it's a little bit different way. Uh, on, the, on the regional level, uh, the government uh, really wants to uh, support the uh, rise of uh, new companies like startups and spin-offs. Of course, it should be a part of the ecosystem together with the centers uh, of AI research. And uh, this, is, uh, this is, of course, a long-term bet. On the nation level, uh, I think crucial is the support for SMEs. We, of course, we talked about uh, education, and it's quite important. But uh, what wasn't mentioned yet is uh, the support of uh, automation of, uh, let's say, especially small and medium enterprises. There is a new uh, government program with uh, more than 9 billion crowns for the next seven years. Uh, that uh, and part of them uh, should go to support the automation of uh, small companies and, and small producers. So um, we need to address all, all, these, all these challenges and uh, those are not just three words. There are real people, real, uh, real money and uh, real stories and real companies and um, not just the plans. So uh, yeah, I can say that uh, this all is happening now. Uh, you probably said that, uh, you probably uh, saw that uh, even Vice President of the Commission, Mr. Ansip, uh, just expressed that uh, Czech Republic is one of the leaders in uh, so-called AI transformation in Europe. So for maybe one, the first time in 10 years, we are pretty, pretty good uh, in something on the European level. And uh, the government is not uh, being left behind right now, at least. Yeah, just, just a few words. So, so the technological progress uh, change that's taken place until now, and we were talking about it in the morning again, uh, hit the United States sort of in the middle of the uh, education, you know, non-college education, highly skilled but not highly educated workers were essentially de-skilled and brought back down to the unskilled level, and that's where the con you know, impact has been. Uh, in Germany, as I understand, in Europe, it's been more towards the bottom uh, that uh, the impact has, has occurred so far. And I think with AI coming in, as Stepan pointed out, we'll have this moving up, further up. And the question is, um, uh, you know, what is going to be the direct impact? And what are going to be the skills that are going to be complementary to the technology that's being developed? Because that's where the demand will go up, right? It's, uh, there's going to be skills that are going to be substituted away, and those skills that will be needed are the complementary ones. So I think the countries and firms that will wisely uh, go for those kinds of skills will thrive. Uh, the problem that I'd like to put on the table is that the studies so far primarily in the US, but some have international validity, are indicating that the uh, firms that are most advanced uh, tend to be very productive, meaning they use less and less labor per unit of output as they proceed. And also, the labor's share in value added and GDP is falling. And that we see around the world on the aggregate level you know, significantly for decades now. So I think that will increase as well. So there will be this shift and the firms that will go under, that will not make it, are the ones that are more labor intensive and where the labor share has historically been higher. So those will disappear and the ones, the leaders in the more concentrated industrial structure uh, will be the ones who use relatively less labor, pay it relatively less compared to the whole value added, so the share wise it pays less. And I think that's going to have an impact that uh, will be a major social and political uh, effect in addition to the uh, ec economic effect. Um, I 
think we are still in a, and if you talk to researchers in AI, most of them would um, make the same point, we are still at the beginning of this technology and the idea that this is as stable and as powerful that it will disrupt everything tomorrow is not really true. Because most of these things we talk or assume as to be AI is um, pattern recognition, and so it, it's statistics. <laughs> um, and most of the time, the, the context where you put it in is the, the, the still the, um, the crucial point. Um, just from the knowing the context, you can decide what kind of data sets will are sensefully put into a learning process, for example. Um, all those medical examples, we have a lot of um, hospitals um, who step back from Watson again. Um, I wouldn't say um, that is not a powerful tool we have, of course, and it made, did make a lot of progress in the, the last years, but still um, to put it into companies so that it will make pro in a productive and robust and effective way um, you still need context, putting it in, deciding which data will be uh, providing the learn sets. Um, we have a lot of startups claiming that they're doing AI. If you really look into the technologies, just relational data banks. So there's a lot of overestimation still, and we have to really look into what is really a powerful tool and where we can we put it really. Um, I think we're still not, not at the least at the moment where we we see a lot, a huge amount of jobs go due to AI. <laughs> I don't see it. And I think um, what we will see is that uh, what we, we uh, talk about, if you talk about ironies of automation, this workplaces where you have a uh, automation system that mostly works pretty good, but sometimes it doesn't. And then, but you still have to be able to then act if it doesn't, and you have to recognize. Now, this is the two percent where it's not working. You now see it just in in big technological systems. That's what we have seen in the last years, like big chemical plants uh, or atomic plants or something like that. This is something we will see everywhere where we put AI into, and I think we have to. Um, talk about what kind of qualification do I need if I have a system where I can rely on most of the time, but not always. <laughs> um, this is a different, we know it from, from all like chemical plants and uh, this uh, topic of ironies of automation. This kind of work we will see in more and more occupations and we have to find a, what, what kind of qualification do I need if I have to, to um, assume that every second can be the second where I have to be in charge again. And that's really different to what we had in old expert systems and that's really different to any kind of other automation. And now I think we should talk more about that. What kind of qualification do we need for this kind of um, requirement? And not again just making a prognosis what kind and how many kind of jobs will go away because every kind of task distribution will change dramatically due to this um, uh, kind of technology and nobody knows exactly what um, the, the, what you mentioned with the ATM machine and the, we have so much um, examples where we see new kind of technology if it works it changes a lot of how we do work and maybe uh, we are too focused on how much we how, um, how much jo jobs will go away and we should more talk about what does it make with us if um, systems that mostly work but not always um, coming to every kind of workplace everything is better with ai right uh, well, it's like 40% uh, of European startups that uh, claim to have AI uh, actually uh, do not have any uh, algorithm at all, according to FT. However, um, well, uh, 
In the spring of uh, 1906, it was a good prospect for, for a job, uh, quite unqualified, to wash uh, other people's clothes. In uh, June 1906, young, uh, one young engineer from Chicago came with a great idea to put together a bucket and uh, electric engine uh, and, well, patented first washing machine. I'm afraid uh, that we don't know what the deception will be. Uh, and uh, the, the thing is that we can't say, OK, not, nothing, nothing's going to happen. We have to be prepared. My personal opinion is that there won't be uh, less jobs. Uh, if you go to Amazon Go shop, uh, fully automated in, in um, Seattle, it's just a prototype. You uh, won't see there any any guys uh, like you know like uh, sitting um, at the, at the uh, well uh, in the job at all. It's completely um, completely without people. But uh, there is another room with uh, we can call it uh, concierge for food, uh, and there are guys like uh, helping you with your diet, uh, even cooks that can prepare for you your lunch. Uh, from, from the from the stuff you just bought, etc., etc. We can see that in a big, especially American hotels, that uh, the online check-in and automated check-in uh, allow them to have people at the concierge desk. Even in, let's say, not so not not so good hotels, you can you can afford uh, concierge uh, concierge service right now. So uh, I personally believe that there will there will be a huge transition uh, in jobs, and we we can agree on that. Uh, however, there, wo there will be probably countries rich uh, and poor, not according to, let's say, industry or, or um, uh, natural resources. Uh, the, this this uh, will depend on the, on the jobs we will have in the economy. And that's exactly the point. Uh, well, with the Czech economy. Right now, we need to change it. And AI is a great opportunity for us. We need to, we need to and uh, Professor Schreiner talked about it, like, uh, I think, a couple of months ago, uh, that we went to the first, uh, first transformation of economy. Now, we, we are heading to the second transformation of economy. You can call it digital transformation. I'm afraid there won't be any third chance. And now we have the, we have the time to catch up with at least Western Europe. Uh, maybe it will be in automotive. Uh, maybe it will be in, in other sectors. I don't know what startup can be the next uh, unicorn. We, we don't have any unicorn. Uh, we actually haven't had a unicorn in 30 years. The last unicorn from Czech Republic uh, is Avast, and it was founded in, in 1988. So uh, we believe we can have another one. We can have uh, another company that can be really successful. By the way, uh, Avast is, in the terms of, uh, of uh, users, is the most successful Czech company. They got like 435 million users. Of course, it's not Škoda, but those, gu those guys are, are quite, quite good. And we need uh, other companies like them, like maybe in AI manufacturing, maybe in uh, AI and cybersecurity, I don't know. Um, most of the startups uh, usually usually fail, but uh, we can we can diversify our bets. And uh, the AI, uh, the, the the whole idea of the AI transformation is to have companies that generate uh, new jobs with uh, better payment, with higher product, uh, productivity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I agree with you, but uh, as I said, we have to be prepared for, for the real deception. Yeah, I would add to it also. So I, I think I would also agree, but I would also uh, argue that uh, in some sense, individual countries and Europe as a whole should think of how to avoid the 1990s when it missed the digital era, right? Europe is way behind in this, I'm stressing it again, and it's very hard to get out of it because uh, startups are there to be bought out. They want to be bought out, right? They want to go public. And who buys them? The existing big companies. The Amazons, the 
Apples, the Googles, etc. No European company buys them because there is no European company, right? So that's why it's so difficult for Europe to catch up. So if at this era, if there is going to be another big step like this going with AI, and we're too complacent, we Europeans, um, you know, we're going to go by the wayside. So I think that here one has to think of risk taking and how to position oneself. Um, you know, go back to the 1990s, the dot-com era. Uh, the amount of risk capital that was put in place in the United States was just incredible. A lot of it was wasted, of course, but out of that came the giants, right? A dozen of them, that's enough, even though hundreds of uh, these companies wasted capital in a big way. Um, so, so, yeah, the process is uh, very spontaneous very often, but requires big bets and entrepreneurial bets. And, um, and I think that's what we should ask ourselves. Are we the Europeans, Germans, Czechs and others? You know, really go, go for that because you go to China and it's amazing what they are doing. And the U.S., you know, naturally, the Yankees are like that. They just, they just do it. I mean, that's, that's their nature, right? So, so I think that we have a huge challenge if this is the next big era. Yeah. Just, just, a short, just a short story that, uh, well, we can say it all began, um, it all began the whole AI strategy, etc. It all began with uh, the successful story of uh, the company called DeepStack. Maybe you heard about it. Those guys, uh, well, part of the team, half of the team uh, was from Prague, part, or half of the team from, uh, from Canada. Those guys uh, developed algorithm, uh, can say AI, uh, that is able to play poker, uh, Texas Hold'em, and uh, even they 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 managed to to teach it or it learned itself to bluff in poker. Uh, it was a huge success, uh, published internationally, and the company was bought by uh, Google DeepMind. And uh, well, they relocated the whole team to Canada. So uh, unfortunately, this is a successful story for the guys uh, in DeepStack, not for the Czech Republic, not for Prague. Uh, only one of them stayed in Prague because of his family, and uh, uh, he wanted to stay with his wife at, and children in, in this country. Um, however, this was like you know our Sputnik moment. And uh, a lot of guys decided that uh, next time the DeepMind should open an office in Prague or maybe in, in I don't know, in, in Barcelona or somewhere else, but preferably in, in Prague or Brno. And uh, I talked to uh, the head of uh, Google uh, Jigsaw company in Paris uh, and I asked her what are, you know, uh, the reasons uh, why you, you decide to, to establish the office like uh, DeepMind, or they, they call it Jigsaw in, in Paris. And she told me, well, uh, there are three things. First is that we need to, bo um, we need to buy a team, the, the, the startup. Second, uh, we need to uh, see uh, like academic and research excellence. In, in Paris, it's, uh, it's usually math. Um, and the third thing is the public clear and clear public support uh, and clear plan and strategy. So uh, we lacked the third third one. Now we have uh, all of them. So hopefully next time, uh, even if uh, Google or Amazon or uh, other company um, buys a startup here, we will have at least the R&D center. Uh, located in Prague, uh, not a lot of thing, and not, not a lot of uh, people know that uh, there is so-called Office of Naval Research in Prague uh, of the United States. Uh, we are the only country uh, with the Office of Naval Research uh, that well doesn't have a C basically. Uh, then we have a Cisco R&D, we have IBM R&D, we have the Red Hat in Brno, so it's not so bad. Uh, we have Skype, uh, but uh, we need uh, another one. Sorry, another one. And the next time, of course, we, we want them to stay. We want them to grow, uh, like I've asked us, um, but well, preferably, yeah, build a new new company like Avast or IVG. Right, so it's obvious that this was a great panel because I didn't have to use my 
Last question, which was, what are the chances that Europe will not successfully manage the digital transformation? We, are, we already covered the topic. Uh, we are in the Czech Republic, which is a country not only unusual in terms of the number of cars produced per capita, but also we, in, in that we spent an unusually higher share of GDP on, on innovation and R&D subsidies into private companies. So it's certainly encouraging to hear that we're no longer spending all of it on traditional large companies, but more on SME and AI companies, because if there is indeed a new opening, then this is the one chance perhaps that Europe and including the Czech Republic has of, of uh, and making it on a global level again. Uh, so we're, we're about six, seven minutes from the end. Uh, so there's this dangerous um, uh, opening of, of asking for one question for, from the audience, as long as it's not a, mo a statement but a question, so you know, we, we get a chance to engage the panel. Any, anybody? All right, so I was worried there would be too many questions, but that was obviously not the case. All right, okay, go ahead. Yeah. So my question goes back to the first part, to the automotive debate. Uh, Stepan asked question, what are the dangers that will be lagging behind? And one of you or two of you mentioned that it will be lack of infrastructure and involvement and support from the government. So I have one tough question to Jan Klesla, who is now in closer to the government than before. Uh, if I understand, uh, the government is not very supportive of uh, supporting uh, development of infrastructure for, for e-cars and all this. So how it goes together? Uh, well, I can, uh, I can answer that that's a different ministry, but uh, to, be, uh, to be honest, I believe that uh, in terms of infrastructure, we are responsible for, especially for 5G coverage. Uh, that's quite important for for Saudi Arabian cars and uh, etc. etc. Um, that's a tough political question, because uh, and I'm not involved in that. But uh, I can say just uh, my personal opinion that it's uh, really tough, because on the one hand we have one of uh, we are the country with uh, probably well maybe um, one of well maybe more even the most expensive data in, in the European Union. So we need a new operator, new mobile carrier, uh, like the fourth one, because you know uh, the competition can, can lower the prices without uh, unnecessary regulation. But on the other hand, we need uh, someone to build the infrastructure and to invest to that. So this is always the trade-off, and it's a tough political question right now. Um, as of the other infrastructures, well, there is the national investment plan. So. All right. Uh, uh, excellent. So, so let me thank the panel um, uh, and thank the participants and also the organizers for putting together a wonderful conference today. For those of you who are not able to participate, uh, you know that the papers. I'm sure we'll, we'll be available one way or the other. And uh, thank you all very much for, for coming to today's conference and panel. Thank you.